Assalamualaikum everyone. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udzu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlil fala hadiya lahu. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Ya ayyuhal ladzina amanu tuqullaha wa kunu qawlan sadida yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. Man yati Allah wa rasuluhu. Faqad faza fawzan azima. Amma ba'd. My dear brothers and sisters, all thanks and praise belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek Allah's help and his guidance. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. And whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. O oh, you have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. And Allah tells us that he will amend for us our deeds and forgive us, forgive us our sins. And whoever Allah, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. My dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, I am always grateful to be here. And I'm once again grateful to you for listening as I reflect on some of these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, I'd like to share with you some reflections on two of the Asma al Hasana. And the two of them are Al Ghani and Al Mughni. Al Ghani, which means the rich or the self sufficient, and Al Mughni, which means the enricher. Now, scholars, uh, others as well, I've been following Al Ghazali's list of the 99 names of Allah, but Al Ghazali has paired these names together. Why? Because their meaning is one. So, Al Ghani is an attribute of Allah's essence, while Al Mughni is an attribute of his action. The root word for these attributes are ghain, noon, and ya, which has the meanings of being affluent, having plentiful supply of material goods. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghani, the rich, the self-sufficient. And Allah's richness is different in nature than what we know about in this world. So when we think about someone who is rich or affluent or wealthy, their wealth is a result of some effort being done in delivering a good or, or service, uh, even when that wealth comes through inheritance. So there's some mechanism in the background that's giving them the ability to become rich. So the work and effort received for the monetary compensation and the accumulation of this compensation over time is what provides <clears throat> wealth to an individual. And the accumulation of this, uh, this, um, um, uh, this compensation is what allows a person to become wealthy. So, the wealth that we accumulate is dependent on other people willing to give us some of their wealth in exchange for some product or some good or service that we can offer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rich and wealthy, whether we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. Whether we continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not, Allah will continue to be rich. Or even if we acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence, it doesn't matter. Allah will continue to be rich. So in Surah Fatir, for example, Allah tells us, O oh humanity, it is you who stand in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah alone is the self-sufficient, praiseworthy. Wallahu huwal ghaniyul hamid. The nature of humankind is that we are in constant need. We are always in need of something, whether it is to live, whether it is to breathe, we need food, we need shelter, we need community, we need organs that cleanse our body, and the list can go on and on and on. And there's nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs from us, not even our worship. So Allah will continue to exist until the end of days and beyond. And even then, we will need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And Allah tells us this also throughout the Quran, that there will come a day when we will be judged for our actions in this world. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we need him, we are actually being honored. Why is it? Why is it that we're being honored? Any guidance that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is honorable for us, is honor for us. So Allah will never lead us astray. So in Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about an interaction that Moses -Islam, or Musa -Islam, had with his people. And in this interaction, Moses says to his people, uh, remember Allah's favor upon you when he rescued you from the people of Pharaoh who afflicted you with dreadful torment, slaughtering your sons and keeping your women. Now, prophets from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't just remind people of troubled times from the past. They bring up these moments 
to set the stage for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're very intentional in any and all of these stories that they bring forward. And notice how Moses phrases this, you know, as Allah's favor upon his people. So what does Moses do after setting the stage for this next guidance that he gives? And Moses says, and remember when your Lord proclaimed, if you are grateful, I will certainly give you more. But if you're ungrateful, surely my punishment is severe. So Moses is giving advice. Moses is giving guidance. He says, you know, after giving this advice, if you, along with everyone on earth, were to be ungrateful, then know that Allah is indeed self-sufficient, praiseworthy. So he's communicating what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given and then adding commentary that is in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. So by framing this statement as فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيُّ Hamid, Moses is reminding his people that gratitude is better for them. Even if his people, and by extension all of humanity, were to be entirely ungrateful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's magnificence will remain absolutely untarnished. And there's nothing, nothing we can do that will diminish Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's self-sufficiency. And let's contrast this honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us through his guidance with the humiliation that people give to one another on a daily basis. And we can think just amongst ourselves any number of different humiliating ways in which we can treat other people in our community, in other parts of the world, or just even being online. So remember that people in our very nature and this is true for everybody. We have greed as one of the character traits in our nature. We have a propensity to keep what we have as much as we have for as long as we can. And if a person with some wealth, any amount of wealth, chooses to abstain from giving a portion of his wealth to someone who is clearly in need, then this person is giving humiliation to the person asking them for help. And, and how is that possible? So, Let's just dive on this for a second. When someone comes to us and we reject them, we deny giving them help, even though we can help them and we're in the position to help them, we are perpetuating their dire circumstance. We are, we are telling them, continue on in your misery. So the more we need and depend on another person to meet that need, the more we are subject ourselves to humiliation. Not so the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the less we are in need and the less dependent we are on others to meet our need, then we are not faced with this humiliation. So if I state this differently, the more you ask from other people, the less dignified you are and the less you will, you know, these people will like you. And the less you ask of others, the more dignified you are and the more likely they will like you. So when I say ask of others, I'm strictly talking about material needs here, nothing more. We can ask others for, uh, to give more. For example, if you work in a company, so that is, not what I'm talking about here, but just asking people for something that you need. There's an adage that you may or may not have heard of, and it goes something like, if you need someone, you are their captive. Free yourself from their need, and you are their equal. Give to them, and you become their master. And in this adage, master is not talking about someone who owns another person, like property. It means to express superiority over them, you know, because you are in the position to give as opposed to receive. And our share in this attribute of al-mughni, the enricher, is that we are commanded to give from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. So think about zakah, one of the five pillars of Islam. We are asked uh, to give from what we have. And we are at the doorstep of the month of Ramadan. In fact, a couple of nights away, many Muslims will wait until the blessed month of Ramadan to give from their personal wealth, the 2.5% that we are told we, we, we should give as zakah. So it's easy to see why we would choose to wait for the month of Ramadan. You know, we, we do so because we're told that we have extra blessings for the acts of worship, for the acts of kindness, etc., that we do during those months. So zakah is, is, is that inclination for us to do more of that or do that act of zakah during the month of Ramadan. But we should also consider that there's absolutely no prohibition to give in any of the other 11 months. So the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not limited to the month of Ramadan, even though the month of Ramadan is special for us. So if we choose, you know, we can spread the two and a half percent over the course of a year. Or if we want to still give more, we can still give more beyond the month of Ramadan. In Surah Al-Hadid, you know, we are told, indeed, 
those men and women who give in charity and lend to Allah a good loan will have it multiplied for them and they will have an honorable reward. And this is a very well-known verse um, by many of you um, who continuously give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the verse that many people will cite. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extolling the reward for giving in charity. And nowhere in this verse or in the Quran are we told to only give in the month of Ramadan. So the point I want to drive with this particular is let's give more when we can and let's not just restrict it for the month of Ramadan because we have many good community organizations and, and many other folks who are actually doing more year round and they're not just um, in need in the month of Ramadan alone. So for us in America, you know, we might be inclined to pay it, the zakah, as if it's an annual income tax. So my brothers and sisters, if you find yourself thinking about giving charity like an annual tax or zakah like an annual tax, then we're not living up to the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed. So giving is an activity that we should engage in daily. And it is, it is prescribed to us in our, uh, in our deen from among the five pillars. And it doesn't have to be just about money. In an authentic hadith, the Prophet sallallahu said, uh, and I'm going to quote, you're smiling in the face of your brother is charity. Commanding good and forbidding evil is charity. You're giving directions to a man lost in the city is charity for you. You're seeing for a man with bad sight is charity for you. Your removal of a rock, a thorn, or a bone from the road is charity for you. You're pouring what remains from your bucket into the bucket of your brother is charity for you. So we learn a lot from this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that charity takes many shapes. Our money is not the only means by which we can give charity. In addition to what Allah tells us in the Quran, our Prophet is actually helping us, وسلم, is helping us implement charity in our lives by telling us that a simple act of giving the last scraps of what we have to another person is charity. Something as simple as a smile is charity. And smiling is my favorite uh, part of this hadith. Uh, because it reminds me that I should maintain my smile all day in my interaction with others. Why? Because my smile could be a turning point for someone who is having a difficult day. And we forget sometimes that we all have personal concerns, you know, and we don't necessarily share these personal concerns with everybody because we all want to move through our day, through our week, through our month, through our year, one step at a time. And we all do the best we can every single moment. Okay. So sometimes those concerns can weigh us down and a simple smiling face might just take away for a little moment, a little bit of that concern. So why not give more smiles? And that's what I love about this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. And another point about smiles is that, you know, if we have a face and we have muscles to move our lips around our face, our smiles are an endless supply of charity for us. We don't have to depend on others to increase us in smiles. We can do that on our own. We just need to have that mindset that we want to give more smiles away. And in Surah Al-Imran, Allah tells us, you will never achieve righteousness until you donate some of what you cherish. And whatever you give is certainly well known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the wealth that we have, the wealth that we accumulate, that is not the end goal for us. None of the wealth will travel with us or help us on the day of judgment. The wealth we possess and earn is simply a means to an end. So what is that end is the question we should ask ourselves. And the end is earning the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, what else could be more valuable to us than being in the good graces of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So just like our wealth, many of us have the privilege to earn advanced degrees. And those of us with these degrees, we understand and know the work put into meeting the requirements of earning the degree. Everything from filling out those applications, finding some kind of scholarships to help us offset the cost and maybe even um, you know, defending a dissertation or maybe other kinds of requirements that might be out there. So these specializations in education and knowledge that we have can become a source of pride for us and also a means for us to earn more in this worldly life. However, we also, uh, we also know that knowledge gained through these advanced studies, they don't make us wealthy. You know, we can think of um, at least one person, I'm sure, each and every one of us can think of somebody who didn't finish schooling, for example, or somebody who isn't as well-educated, but possesses tremendous wealth. And it might be perplexing for some of us to say, I have done all this work, I have done all this effort, why do I not have that station uh, in life? 
Okay, maybe that's something that that we have in, in our um, in the back of our mind that that's something we want, but we know that that just doesn't happen, and maybe that's not the path for us. So we can think of capitalism as the thing, the idea that has captured the rest of the world because we have those ideas within us. And from Surah An Najm, you know, we learn, "Wanahu huwa agna wa aqna. and he is the one who enriches wa aqna and impoverishes wa aqna. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the enricher, al mughni So if we believe that what we have is because of us, then we are being ungrateful. We are expressing ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is the source of everything. And you and I are a means to one another. Now, if you have a business and a service that you sell and there's nobody to purchase that service from you, then you don't earn a wage. You don't accumulate wealth or richness. If you work for somebody in a company, big or small, and they don't pay you your wage, then again, you're not being enriched. And if you create a product and that product isn't marketed to people, and then same result, you don't earn a wage. And if your manager doesn't give you that promotion that you want, then again, you don't earn a higher wage. So this can go on and on and on, as you can tell. So you and I are only means to one another, while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source, is the one who enriches all of us. And we should know this because we recite Surah Al-Fatiha at least 17 times a day if we maintain our salah. And from Surah Al-Fatiha, what is one of the verses we recite? We ask Allah, You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. So we learn two things from this verse alone. We know that we need help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we also know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to be asked. And how do we know this? We know this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet sallallahu has given us the guidance, has taught us this chapter and guided us to recite this chapter in every single ruku, in every single salah. So why then would we imagine that we have and what we do is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what do we read after, after this verse? After iyaqa na'budu wa iyaqa na'ustain, after asking Allah for help. What do we recite? We recite, mustaqim. Guide us along the straight path. So we ask Allah, and we ask Allah for guidance along the straight path. Okay? And not just guide us on the straight path. We ask Allah, Sirat al alayhim, The path of those you have blessed. So now we get even more specific. Not just guide us, but guide us in the path that you have blessed. For those that you have enriched. And then in that same verse, we say, uh, Not those you are displeased with, or not those you have led astray. So asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guidance. Allah is giving us this guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enriching us with how, you know, the how we should live our lives in this world. How living that life is going to benefit, benefit us in the hereafter. So inshallah, may Allah elevate our understanding of the Qur'an so that we may all live our lives under the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us the wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most. My dear brothers and sisters, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask Allah for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. I hope you found benefit from this discussion. While not always easy to live our lives exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us, you know, we should pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the insights we need to unlock the knowledge for us so that we can live our lives in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's nobody else whose approval should matter to us most. There's nobody else whose guidance we should follow. And inshallah, may Allah accept all of our good deeds and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate us all, enrich us all, and increase us in Iman as we come close to this month of Ramadan. And may our hearts gravitate towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as the Sufis would say, you know, take that rust off our heart, off our qalb. Because by doing so, we will find ourselves reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month of Ramadan. And inshallah khair, may each and every one of you have a blessed Ramadan and may your fast also be accepted in this month of Ramadan. 
in al Muslimina wal Muslima, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'mina, wal Qanitina wal Qanita, wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqat, wal Sabirina wal Sabirat, wal Khashiina wal Khashiat, wal Mutasaddiqina wal Mutasaddiqat, wal Sa'imina wal Sa'imat, wal Hafizina Furujahum wal Hafizat, wal Zakirina Allah Kathira wal Zakirat, Addallah Allahum, Maghfiratan wa Ajrin Azima, Rabbana Hablana min Azwajina wa Zuriyatina Kurata Ayuna wa Jalna wa Mutakina Imama, Rabbana Faghfir Lana, Zunubana wa Kafir Anna Sayyatina wa Tawafana Ma Alabrat, Rabbi Jalni Mukim wa Salati wa Min Zuriyati Rabbana wa Takabal Dua, Rabbana La Tuzir Kulubana Ba'da Iz Hadaytana wa Hablana Min La Dunka Rahma, Inna Ka Anta Wahhab, Rabbana Alayka Tawakalna wa Alayka Anabna wa Nabal Masir, Rabbana Zalamna Anfusana wa Illam Taghfir Lana wa Tarhamna Al Nafinana Al Makhasirin, Inna Allaha Yamru Bil Adli wa Ahsani wa Ita Izil Qurba, we can ha in al-fashai wal munkari wal bagi. Ya izukum lalakum tazakaroon. La ilaha illam ta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalameen. Subhanahu wa bika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. Wa salamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen. Allahumma ameen.